Hallelujah. All right, all right, all right, all right. You guys, you guys ready to go? I know you've been noticing this by the notes and stuff like that, that uh, we've been in a, like a big questioning series. Have you noticed that? Now, we, we, didn't, we skipped it on Christmas, you know. <laughs> we kind of went with no room at Christmas. But uh, before Christmas, we started out, it, it was almost like questions you would want to ask God. Uh, <laughs> number one is, you know, um, why do bad things happen to good people? Why do the righteous suffer? And then, why hadn't God answered my prayer yet? That's a, that's a big one. And then we looked at, uh, will a man serve God for nothing? You know, what motivates us to serve God? And do we serve God and love God and believe God and trust God and obey God just because he's God? Not for any particular uh, motive that, uh, of gain for myself would I, would I serve God. And that was the book of Job. And then today, uh, I, I think probably one of the biggest questions that, that everyone has for God is, uh, what is your will for my life? Because you hear about God's will, and you hear people say that you, you need to know God's will, and you read passages every once in a while that'll have something about the will of God. And, of course, the, the question comes, how would, I, how would I know the will of God? If God has a will for me, God has a purpose for me. As a matter of fact, in... in um, in, in polls and questionnaires, uh, I guess ever since there's been polls and questionnaires, when asked, if you could ask God one question, what would it be? The overwhelming number one answer to that is always, why am I here? God, why did you put me here? Is there a purpose for me? And really the question that goes along with that is the one you have on your notes before you today how do I accomplish it? Did you put me here for a purpose? Am I here for a reason? And then if I am here for a reason, how can I know what that reason is? And how can I accomplish that reason? And of course, that has always rang true to Christians as, what is God's will for my life? Now, I know many Christians, and, and, and I believe that uh, that I have a, a, a good understanding and a truth from the Lord on this about, about God's will because I've been serving the Lord for, gosh, how long now, 45 years? I mean, I'm, as a Christian, as a Christian now. I've been preaching 43, something like that. I can't even remember. It's been so long. started when I was 18, <laughs> long time ago. So I've been serving the Lord a long, long time. Yeah, yeah. And in every, every part and every section of my life, I've had to make choices and decisions about direction and where do we go and what do we do and how do we do this and does what God want us here or does God want us there? Uh, how would you know when God is ready for you to leave and move somewhere else and minister? You know, I mean, what, what, what is God's will for my life? I've asked myself many, many times. I mean, I know God's will is that I would represent him and preach the word and share the word and teach. And I mean, I, I, I know that, but you know, you can do that anywhere. How, how do you know you're where you need to be? I mean, what is his will for my life? And, and I think the reason that many people have trouble knowing the will of God and finding the will of God is because they have misconceptions about what God's will is. Matter of fact, one of the verse that I have uh, here in, out of Ephesians 5, I just want you to see that God wants you to know his will. Just verse 15, see then that you walk circumspectly. Now, that's an old, an old English word. That means just be careful how you walk. Walk with some care in life, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So God has a will, a purpose. God has a direction. God has a, a way, a plan, some procedure for me. And he wants me to know this because it helps me to be wise. It helps me to walk with care in life. So, so, so many Christians don't find God's will because I think that 
we, don't, we have some misconceptions about what the will of God is. Now, I didn't write this one on your notes, but this is really, I think, one of the biggest. <laughs> I just wanted to talk about it. I didn't really want to write any notes about it for you. But one of the biggest misconceptions, I think, in the world about God's will has to do with, um, with, with actually uh, what it is. I mean, just, the, just what, what, when we talk about what is it? Is it, a, is it a treasure? You know, I mean, you hear people talk about it, and they talk about finding it and wanting to find it and searching for it and praying for it. And they talk about it in terms as if somehow the will of God is a treasure that God is hidden somewhere, and you have to follow the map in order to find where the treasure is. Because if you can ever find where the treasure is, boy, life's going to be great in the will of God. Life's wonderful in the will of God. It's where God will bless you. and God, you know Your provisions are where the will of God is for you. If God's will is up there and you're down here, you'll never have the treasure of God because God has it up there for you. And so the terms that you talk about it in are terms that would, that would denote a belief that, okay, God's will is a treasure it's buried somewhere, that God buried it somewhere, and he's given us a Bible, and this Bible has all kind of steps in it and directions to the treasure. And so my job as a Christian is to follow the treasure that the Bible talks about until somehow I can find the will of God. Three steps forward, seven steps to the right, three steps backward, turn around, hold your nose, look to the left. <laughs> like, and our life is a constant search for some treasure that we're looking to find that if we can ever find it, we're going to be happy and blessed, but heaven knows that if we'll ever find it, and you need to find it because God says, it's there, and he wants you to know it, and he, he's put it out there. But if you haven't found it yet, uh, you better get busy because, man, you, you want to find this. And <laughs> I mean, you see, it, 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 that's a misconception about the will of God, like somehow the will of God is a thing. It's a thing that I can find. Mechanically, I can, I can locate it, and I can center in on it, and then it's going to tell me, everything I need to know. And I'm going to be healthy, wealthy, and wise and blessed beyond measure if I can just find the will of God. And then you're thinking to yourself, why haven't I found the will of God? Well, did God move it? I mean, I'm going along here really pretty good, and I'm finding, I think I'm close to finding the will of God for my life. But all of a sudden now, I've stepped off the path and I've started doing some things that God's not pleased with, so I'm, I've kind of gotten back into sin a little bit, and, you know, that's not pleasing God, so I thought I was close to his will, but when I got to sinning, he, he must have just reached out there and moved it somewhere so I wouldn't find it, so I can start searching all over again to try to find the will of God. So I'm just saying to you that if you think like that, Get out of that way of thinking. You're, you're never going to find something that's not there. You're looking for something that doesn't exist. You're looking for something that, that, would, that, that you can find that would spell out everything and, and give you every answer to every issue and detail and direction of your life. You're never going to find something like that because it does not exist. God's will is alive. God's will is dynamic. God's will is not some treasure buried somewhere that he expects us to find through diligent searching, using the Word of God and the Holy Spirit and all of the ministry tools to find something that will just open up the world to me. So misconceptions are, 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 are there about, about the will of God. Let me give you another misconception. This one is on your notes for you. Uh, uh, this is a mystical, a mystical approach. Uh, 
our, our new age people, uh, and, and that's just a generalized term for a lot of religion nowadays that has basically worldly characteristics and, and uh, philosophies and practices of the world, and, 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 and they appear to be somewhat spiritual, and people try to make you think they're, they're spiritual, but, but we, just call it, we just call it new age. And the new agers, you know what they tell you? They say, here's how, you, here's how you find God. Here's how you approach God. You get somewhere off by yourself, and you get in a quiet place, and you get in a comfortable position, and you close your eyes, and you begin to meditate. On what? I, I don't know, but follow me. <laughs> meditate. And you meditate. And, you, and, 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 and what you're really doing is you're, is you're, is you're, is you're trying to, uh, to, to put your mind into neutral you know, and, 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 and let it go blank. And I know for some that's much easier than others, but <laughs> you let it go blank. And then all of a sudden, what you're waiting on now, what you're waiting on is you're waiting on this feeling to come over you. And when this feeling comes over you, it's going to be wonderful, and you're going to know that that feeling, that grand feeling is the, is the Word of God. And you're going to find the will of God when you meditate and be quiet and let this feeling come over you as if somehow God's will is a, 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 a quiver in your liver or a, you know, a hiccup in your heart or, a, or, or, or goosebumps playing leapfrog up and down your back. That, that, that's the will of God. It's, a, it's some kind of a feeling that you have. The trouble with feelings, and I, I know you're going to know this before I even say it, the trouble with feelings is that they're unreliable. Because feelings have all kinds of sources, don't they? I mean, if I'm sick, I, I, I don't feel good, uh, my, I think certain things. If I'm tired, I'm not, as, I'm not as patient and I'm not as willing to, you know, be ambitious, I, I'm, and, and, and I'm fatigued, and it causes me to feel certain ways, and, and anxiety causes me to feel certain ways. Uh, something drastic happens, and, and I'm just out there, and I can feel things that are not there. I, feeling, it, it could be a bad pizza, I mean, for heaven's sake. The way you feel could be just you need some Pepto or something. You know? I mean, come on. Feelings are unreliable. You know, I, I remember many times in the Scripture, the Apostle Paul himself said he had trouble knowing what God would have him to do. As a matter of fact, I've read in the past few weeks some Scriptures up here that showed you that three different times he tries to go, <laughs> to go into a certain area to preach the gospel and the Holy Spirit stops him every time he starts to go in there. So he had, t I mean, it, it, it's, not, it's not uncommon for, for, for people to not know exactly what God would have them to do. Even the greatest and most spiritual of all things. And the reason why, the scripture tells us, there's a prophet in the scripture. His name is Jeremiah. Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. I guess he cried a lot. He wrote the book of Lamentations. If you've never read the book of Lamentations, to lament, you know, you probably get to see a little bit about what he was like. But here's what he said in chapter 17 of the book of Jeremiah. He said, the problem we have with feelings is that we have a sick heart. Here's exactly what he said. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Deceitful comes from the Hebrew word that also signifies to be sick. So what Jeremiah is saying to us is, you know the problem we have with feelings? We have a sick heart. And when you're sick, you know yourself. When you're sick... You don't think right. You don't feel the same way when you're sick. And so 
To consider and think of God's will as a feeling I get would keep us from never finding the will of God. There's another misconception that God's will is a formula. Now, this would be the mechanical approach. And most of the books that you find in bookstores about God's will and finding God's will, 10 easy steps to finding the will of God, you know, will of God for dummies, uh, you know, all of the books written about the will of God, most of them are about this type of approach right here. It's, it, it's a formula approach. It's like, okay, I do this and this and this, and boom, I've got the will of God. It's a formula that you follow. So you can know the will of God by just finding the right formula and plugging into that right formula, and you'll get some you know, automatic results. Well, to a mechanistic society like we live in, where we want everything quick, fast, and in a hurry, we have push-button programs and microwave society, and we want it now. Have it your way, immediately. Boy, this approach appeals to a, to a society like we live in. Because it basically says, push, pull, click, click, be spiritual this quick. I mean, you know, come on, put your money in. Get the formula down. Now, there, 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 there are about three things that, that I want to warn you about this formula deal. Three reasons that I think you need to just forsake that. Don't, don't, be, don't be looking for a formula. Number one, it's not fair to God. Because think about it. The formula basically says that whatever happens is the will of God. Everything that happens is God's perfect will. So if I fall down the stairs, I should really basically get up and look at God and say, whew, boy, I'm glad that's over with. Because it was undoubtedly going to happen because it was the will of God. If somebody gets cancer, don't worry, it's the will of God. If somebody has heart trouble, don't worry, that's God's will. Somebody's marriage breaks up. Don't fret over that. That's God's will. In other words, everything that happens is God's will. And if everything that happens is God's will, God gets blamed for a bunch of bad stuff. If you don't believe it, I mean, just I'll, I'll show you how your, your, your thinking's poisoned, even right now. When, 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 I, when, all right, when I say, well, it must have been the will of God, do you think that what is going to follow is bad or good? When I say it must have been the will of God, most of you are thinking, oh my goodness, what tragedy just happened. Or read an insurance policy. And in an insurance policy, it has an exclusion for what it calls the acts of God. What are the acts of God? A baby being born? A couple getting married and living happily ever after? Somebody being healed from sickness or life? That is, is that an act of God? No, an act of God is a tornado and a flood and a hurricane and a tsunami and an earthquake and he getting hit by lightning. That's what God does, bad stuff. So luck gets credit for everything good. Man, whoo, I sure was lucky that time. Heavenly days, boy, that could have been horrible. I've been lucky, you know. So luck gets credit for everything that's good, and God gets blamed for everything that's bad on this earth. I'm just saying, if you're looking for a formula, quit looking for one. Because it doesn't work. Not only is it unfair to God, it doesn't work. I tell you what, Tanya and I have been married for 41 years. So 42 years ago, maybe even 43 years ago, because I probably started praying a couple of years really seriously about whether Tanya and I should be married. Now, would you say, would you conclude that who you marry would be a will of God question? That you would want to know, God, is this person that I'm considering married, is this your will that I marry them? That would be an important will of God question, right? Along with, 
do I go to college? Where should I live? What kind of business should I be in? <laughs> Those are all big will of God questions. You'd want to know, am I doing the right thing, God? Am I going the right direction? Am I thinking the right thing here? Well, I'm going to tell you, I started praying for about two years, and I was diligent, man. I searched the scripture. I read verses. I was, just, I was, I was looking in every corner and nook and cranny of my Bible, and I'm going to tell you, I looked for two years, and I never found written in the Bible one place, Keith, Mary, Tanya. I don't think it's in there. So if I'm looking as a formula, click, click, push, pull, fill in the blank, God will, I'm going to be sorely disappointed because the Bible doesn't have all of that kind of stuff in it. As a matter of fact, you'll find when you read the Bible, you don't find, I mean, you find very, very few areas where, where, where it deals with, uh, with uh, 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 techniques at all. But you'll find hundreds of verses about a relationship with God. And so it doesn't work. Formulas, it's unfair to God, and it's unfair to you. I mean, think about this. If I believe that God's will is a formula and that all I need to do is find the right formula, then what happens to me is I think that everything that happens is God's will. So what do I need to struggle about? Think. Oh, if God's will is is a formula and God is going to happen because, you know, everything in the world that happens is God's will, then I don't have to make any choices. I don't have to make any decisions. I'm a puppet and God's pulling the strings in my life. I don't have to discipline myself. I don't have to, I don't have to consider things. I don't have to try to make wise choices. All... I just, I just flow through life, and if something bad happens, man, God did it. It's his fault. And what does that do to me? It keeps me immature. I'm going to tell you something. When you, and, and, this, and, and I'm telling you, we are in a society now, not only in America, but all over this crazy world we're living in, where nobody wants to take responsibility for anything. It's ridiculous. It's not my fault. It's, it's my race. I'm so, so weak. It's not my fault. It's, it's my gender. I'm a, if I was just another gender, I could we're doing, but it's not my fault. I'm part of some subgroup. I mean, just, just you, all that does is it, when you pass the buck, it makes you weak. And that's what's happening, and, and that's what would happen if God's will was whatever happens is his will, uh, you know, just, just get ready, grab a knot, and hang on because the will of God is going to drag you through hell upside down and backwards. No. See, it's, that, that approach doesn't work. What is God's will? I've, I've blown by a bunch of things up here. I don't know. I'm just preaching. I'm not, I'm not running my, my, my slides. Am I? God's will is a fellowship. All right, here's a verse. I, I just want you to see this because you're sitting here going, God's will's a fellowship. What? All right, look at this verse, 1 Corinthians 1, 9. God is faithful. Would you agree with that? Okay. By whom you were called, what are you called into? The fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Do you know that our, our, our relationship with God is, is like a fellowship? You know what a fellowship is, right? I mean, I've given you the definition of fellowship before. Fellowship is a bunch of fellows on the same ship. That's what fellowship is. We're all a bunch of fellows on the same ship. I mean, we're all together. We're in a fellowship. It's like a friendship. So in other words... We've been drawn into a friendship with Jesus Christ, a fellowship with Jesus Christ, a relationship with Jesus Christ. Our, 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 our dealings with God is not a, a closed system item. 
It is a living, dynamic, vital uh, life. If the will of God was a closed system, it would mean that if I ever make a mistake, then I've blown it forever. Because, I mean, in a closed system, you get one chance, and if you don't get it right, buddy, you, you, you've blown it forever because there's no changing it. It's in, it's in this closed system. It just keeps circulating, circulating, circulating around on itself. No, but the will of God is not a closed system. It's a dynamic living system that is a fellowship, a friendship with Jesus Christ, and it makes room for human error. You, hey, look, you, you, you cooks know this. You're, ba you're a baker, and you're baking something. And you go th down every list of every item and ingredient that's on that baking list, and you leave out the bacon soda. A little tiny something. It's just a little pinch of something. You leave it out. What happens? You might have a pancake instead of a birthday cake, right? I mean, it, it, it matters. Every little detail matters. And if you leave one ingredient out, you've blown it, and it's gone forever. I mean, uh, think about it. Uh, if, 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 if God's will is closed up like that, then if I make a mistake, or maybe, let's don't say I make it, let's say somebody else made one. And it, it would mess me up in the will of God. Uh, as an example, uh, uh, let's say I, I married the wrong person. And that means that then your mate married the wrong person. Don't be looking at each other, okay? <laughs> I'm not trying to start anything. This is just an example. But, all right, I married the wrong person. All right, that means whoever married me is married to the wrong person. That means the person they were supposed to marry is married to the wrong person because that person, and then that means the person they married also was the wrong person because they had somebody, and then they married the wrong person. Because, and before you know it, we were, we're all married to the wrong person because one person made a mistake. Because Adam made a mistake, we're all condemned to be married to the wrong person because there was one person for everybody and we got it all messed up. So God's will is not, is not, is not closed. It, it's dynamic. It's living. It's open. It's a, it's a, it, it's a, it's a relationship. It's a fellowship. It's a, it's a, it's a walk with God. And as we walk with him and we have fellowship with him, then God moves us in his will. It is. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a path. It's a, it's a relationship. And he guides us in that relationship. So God's will, then, is a, is a fellowship. Now, in the Bible, the Bible compares a relationship and a fellowship with God to marriage many times. I don't know if you've noticed this, but the Bible is, when you want to talk about a relationship with God, it, it, it just about always brings you to a, a relationship like between a husband and a wife and, and a family. And it says, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. This is what a relationship with God is like. And it, and it starts talking about a husband and a wife and a relationship with each other. And, and, and so God is saying to you, look, if you, if you want to get this relationship issue understood between you and God... Uh, think about it. Uh, think about it like like your relationship. Now, when we were dating, when Tanya and I were dating, uh, I was in college, and I was in college in Jackson. Tanya was in high school in Meridian. We were ninety miles away from each other. I was poor. I didn't have an automobile, so I couldn't come home every weekend. I wanted to. This, man, these long-distance romances are tough, I'm telling you. And, and so we, you know, we had only been together a, a year or so, you know, just, I mean, we were teenagers. We were young. We were, you know, we were, we were still trying to, to, to sort out life. In, in, in a, and, and I can remember, I can remember Tanya would send me a couple of letters, at least a couple of letters every week, sometimes more. 
My roommate, which shall remain anonymous. <laughs> but, but anyway, my roommate would go to my mailbox, and he knew my combination, and he would check my mailbox every day to see if we got a letter from Tammy. <laughs> About halfway through the semester, he said, if you don't think you're going to marry her, I think I am. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> and anyway, she would write me some of the mushiest letters. Of course, I never wrote mushy stuff. Um, I was cool, but Tanya wrote mushy stuff. And I promise you, probably right now, if I went back and read some of those letters, I, would, I, I might even be a little bit embarrassed by what was actually said there. It'd be like, ooh, can't believe that. Because we were far apart, we had to write down our feelings to, about each other and send them written 90 miles so that we could explain and discuss how we felt about each other. But you know, we've been married for 41 years now. And we don't have to write them down anymore. And I don't have to write them because she can read me like a book. I'm going to tell you that. <laughs> because of our relationship. So what am I saying to you about the will of God in relationship here? I'm just saying to you that the deeper the relationship, the fewer the rules. The deeper the relationship, the closer the relationship, uh, the, the, the fewer the do's and the don'ts, do this and do that and think this way. I mean, the deeper the relationship, the, the, the more the relationship opens up and, and we don't have rules and we don't have to follow different because we're in relationship with each other. The same is true in a relationship with God. The closer our relationship, the fewer the rules. Now, I'm not telling you that God doesn't expect us to be holy because he does, but I'm just saying to you that the closer you live to God, the less you live by don't do this and don't do that and quit doing that and stop doing that and you never can do that and start doing this and go here and do that. I mean, those kind of things just kind of fall by the wayside in the closeness of a real relationship where really you can almost read somebody's mind, you know? It's amazing. It's amazing how often we'll be talking and uh, I could finish the sentence, you know, because I know what's, what's going to be said. And so it's the same with 10, 41 years of relationship. So, all right, let me close this out. If God's will is a relationship, then the most important thing about knowing it and moving in it would be your attitude. What is your attitude about the will of God? Well, I think I wrote some in your notes. Let me just see if I can even get close. Yeah, there we go. Don't be fatalistic about God's will. And I'm just going to say, I'm just going to kind of put ditto a lot of the things I've already said to you. I don't even have to really say any more about that. To be fatalistic about God's will just means that I believe everything that happens, happens, and it's God's will. And so I don't have to search for anything. I don't have to try to know anything. Uh, I have no, uh, I, there's nothing for me to do in connection with God's will. That's fatalistic. It basically just keeps me limited, keeps me small, and keeps me not searching. Number two, don't be fearful about God's will. Now, being fearful in, in, in connection with <laughs> With, with the will of God is that for many people, even the subject of the will of God is scary. Uh, when you think about the will of God, you're thinking, God's going to call me to outer Mongolia and I don't want to go to outer Mongolia. So you won't even bring up God's will because you're afraid God's going to call you to outer Mongolia. Or, God's going to make me be a fanatic. I know he is. I know he is. It's going to be horrible. I'm going to just go off the deep end being a fanatic for God. So you won't even bring up the will of God because you're afraid that God's going to make you a fanatic. 
heaven days. God might want me to raise my hand in a service or something, you know. God, God might me want to do a dance or something. You know, I don't know what it might be, what you're thinking about. But to be fearful of the, uh, of the will of God, and God says, uh, don't be afraid. Because I didn't come to scare you, I came to save you. Have you ever been, pray, have you ever been afraid to pray Thy will be done in connection with your job. <laughs> Man, no, I wouldn't pray thy will be done on that. <laughs> or your children. Or your marriage. Why would, we be, why, would be, why would we be afraid to pray? Thy will be done in my marriage. Are, are, you, afraid of, are you afraid of change? Well, if I pray thy will be done in marriage, God might change my lifestyle. Well, bless God, it probably needs to change. But you're fearful of that. Or criticism, somebody might start talking about you or something. Or, or, or you're afraid you can't stick with it. Well, if I say okay to God and follow God, I might get out here and God might make it so hard that I don't want to do it anymore. And then how am I going to get out of it, you know? I think the root of fear for God's will has to do with the fact that we really don't think that God has our best interest at heart. If I'm afraid of God's will for my life, then I think God's making some bad choices that are going to be bad for me because God doesn't really want me to be happy and God doesn't really want the best for me. Now, there are many verses that you could go to, but let's go to, to the weeping prophet again, all right? One more time. Let's look. I think I have it. Yeah, here it is. Jeremiah 29. Look at, look at this. All right, I'm going to read it for you. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to make you miserable. <laughs> plans to get you run out of town. Plans to make people hate you. Is that what it says? No, it doesn't even say that in the Living Bible, does it? It says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you. Whoa. Plans, and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. You know what Jeremiah is saying to us about God and his will for our life? You know what God wants for us? what we would want for ourselves if we had enough sense to want it. God says, look, my, my plan for you is great. I, I, I love you and my will is an expression of, 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 my, of my love for you. So everything I have for you and want you for you and lead you in, uh, it's not anger, it's not wrath, it's love. I, I, I want you to be happy. I want you to be blessed in life. You know, our... Our philosophy as human beings for, the, for, for happiness in life is pretty much, um, uh, let's see, um, you know, it slipped out of my mind on, in the Constitution. Life, liberty, yeah. Life, liberty, and the purchase of happiness. Like somehow we can just, <laughs> we can buy it, you know. And God said, no, 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 no. I, 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 I have a way to real happiness for you. And then, the last attitude is uh, don't be frustrated about the will of God. Let me just say this quickly to you about frustration. Um, maybe for you, God's will is confusing. Maybe it's complicated. Maybe you just can't seem to figure it out. And maybe you've even said, I, I don't know what God's will is for my life, so I just kind of stumble around and bumble around and fumble around and say, forget it, forget it. Maybe it's because you're looking for something that doesn't exist. <laughs> Maybe it's because you're looking for some misconception about the will of God. The will of God, those of you that, that were with us in seven steps to the seven steps to experiencing God, do you remember what reality number four was? It was the longest one. And I think Lawrence was the only one that ever memorized 
<laughs> God speaks to me by the Holy Spirit through the Bible, prayer, circumstances, and the church to reveal himself, his purposes, and his ways. I think that is, is key to understanding and finding the will of God. God's will is not a treasure on a treasure map. God's will is not a formula that you have to find the right answers to the crossword puzzle and fill it in and you'll have the will of God. God's will is a relationship, a living dynamic relationship that even takes into account your mistakes. Do you think that God's will for your life is so fragile that if you make a single mistake, you've blown it and you can no longer walk in the will of God? Can you imagine this? The Bible is filled with people who made mistakes. God's not nearly as picky as we are about who he uses. Moses could have said, I killed somebody. I could never be used by God. David could have said, I committed adultery and murder. I could never be used by God. Peter could say, I was scared and cussed in front of a girl in front of a fire and denied I ever even knew Jesus. Jesus can't use me anymore. The Apostle Paul could have said, I was a Pharisee of Pharisees and I killed Christians and I, I, I persecuted the church. God could never use me anymore. No, God's will makes, uh, makes room for even the frailties of humanity. Because it's alive and it's a relationship. And here's what God will speak to you about your direction, about your life, about, about the purpose, about the intent of, of everything to do with your life through the Bible, prayer, circumstances, and the church. The church doesn't mean like this building. It means Christians means other Christians who, who speak and the Holy Spirit leads them in speaking things. And sometimes they say things they don't even know what they're saying. They think they're just telling you some little something and it's an answer to what you've been praying about. It's ridiculous. Circumstances, right place, right time. Boy, if that didn't happen, I would have never been there. Circumstances. God moves the circumstances and you get an answer. Man, prayer. You're praying and all of a sudden it, you see something that you've never seen before. You consider it in another way. All of a sudden a light comes on and it's, ooh, I never thought about that. The Bible how many of you read your Bible? Don't raise your hand. I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. But I'm just, 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 just listen to the question. How many of you read your Bible every day? You open it up and you read it. A verse, two verses, a chapter, half, I mean, you, you do it, but you do it all the time. How, how many of you study the Bible? You get you a little study course or you, or you have some, uh, some, some commentary and you look at things and you read and you try to study and say, what does this say and what is it about? Well, how much time do you spend with the Scripture? Do you memorize any of it? Do you know any verses by heart? Is there anything that could come out of you in case you didn't have it one day? Could it, would there be anything that would say, well, what could it be? You know, do you have any of that memorized? Well, what is your consumption of the Word of God? Well, pastor, I come to church once a week. And you expect to find something about God's will? And you're so casual, you don't even care to see what God said and what he has for you? I'm just saying, look, folks, the will of God comes from a relationship in which you spend time with him. And you know him. And you understand him. Because you have a relationship with him. You talk to him. You hear his word. You see his word. 
you're, you're guided by what you see and hear from him. And he'll move you wherever you need to be. And you will be doing whatever he has for you to do. I tell you, I've been walking in God's will for a long time. Because I've just been obeying him. I've been listening to what he said. I've been cooperating with his movements and so forth. Every once in a while, I get mad at myself for doing that. I say, why didn't I do this? And why didn't you <laughs> get all questioning about what I did 10 years ago, 15 years ago? And why didn't I, back then when all that mess went on, why didn't I just call up somebody in North Carolina and say, hey, man, I'm looking for a church. You got any up there that need a pastor? And just fly on up out of here. I'd be on some golf course somewhere right now, probably playing with the president of the bank and uh, drinking coffee on the porch when we get through. My biggest concern would be what time do we going to start tomorrow? That's kind of what I think. But I, but I didn't do that. You know why? Because that wasn't God's will for my life. How do I know that? Because... He spoke to my heart about this, and I obeyed him and listened to him and followed him. And has it been easy? Mm -mm. No, 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 man. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm 63 years old. It's time for me to retire. And God looks down at me and says, you think it's time to retire, but it's just time to refire. You know, I got the biggest adventure for you in your lifetime. But you know that because it's a relationship, not a formula, not some kind of magic treasure hunt, but a relationship, and God speaks to your heart. Okay, I don't know if I've made it more confusing or helped you in any way, but God's will is great. You're walking in it. It's a relationship. Don't be afraid of it. He's probably not going to send you to northern Mongolia. Mongolia. I can't say for sure, but he's probably not going to do that. All right.